with the high lines, like if I was teaching a player nowadays, I would never say shoot a high line anymore. Because in their head, it's like this loopy. I used to do these loopy. As long as it hits the target, it's a perfect high line. Now I'm like, no, that's not perfect. It has to be as wherever the block is or, you know, you have to go higher. But I want that thing in the corner as fast as possible. That's the best high line. If the block's huge, okay, it's going to have to be higher. It might have to loop a little bit. But the best high line guys, are they're hitting high lines. They're not shooting high lines. So hit your shots. And that also makes you not drop your elbow and not think about this loopy anything. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Better at Beach podcast. My name is Mark Burick, and we are here to get better at beach volleyball. And we have somebody who you guys are going to love. If you're here live and you're going to ask the questions, go ahead and pour them into the chat. But I just know that we're going to run into a lot of conversation. So I hope we can get to some of those questions. Either way, write them in the chat or write them in the comments when you do see this. And we can respond with any questions there. Our guest today is a blocking specialist, but he's also an incredible defender. He's an all-around player. He's a champion. He's an Olympian. And he just won the Manhattan Beach Open. And according to him, he's still riding on cloud nine. Needs a little more <laughs> celebrating. But I want you guys to welcome. Really excited about this conversation, so don't want to waste any time. Let's get right into it. Try. What's up, man? Mark. <laughs> what is happening? So, Dude, thanks for having me on. Of course. Glad to have you. You guys have had us on Sandcast now tw twice, I think. And those are always fun, so it's nice to flip the script a little bit. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> we talked a little bit off camera. This is, it's Tuesday. We're in August. It's August 23rd. And you just won another Manhattan Beach Open. Yeah. You got your name on the pier again. It'll go up there next year. You said you're still riding on cloud nine. It's that's a huge win. So are you still in celebration mode or do you kick right back into workhorse mode or what? Yeah, I'm in like, I don't know what to do with myself mode. Like I legit yesterday, I was like, all right, I'm not going to think about anything. Just like relax for the day. And it was mostly just a family day and recovering from the party. And then today I was like, all right, I should figure out what my week has to look like with you know, because we have Chicago coming up soon. We got to leave in, uh, next Wednesday. But yeah, I feel like in a week or two, I'm going to wish I celebrated a little more. Maybe did like proper two days of celebrating. <laughs> so we're actually going to do a recording tonight on the Sandcast and we're bringing Trevor in. And, nice. you know, he, I think he wants to bust out the whiskey. And who knows? Who knows if I his brother shows up and that crew. It gets dangerous if they show up. And I we'll, still we'll see haven't that. seen the episode that you guys shot recently. I think it was this summer. But Brandon was, with was watching it. Yeah. And he said it was the funniest hour of volleyball yeah. he's like ever been through. He yes. loved it. Do you remember the, the number was, of that episode? Like, is it just Whiskey with the Crabs on Sandcast? Yeah, I would do. No, I don't remember the number. Okay. Yeah, I would just search for Whiskey with the Crabs. It was probably a year ago. And oh, honestly, it was my favorite episode, too. It was <laughs> with... We had we were talking about Olympics. And like, we all have such unique experiences of it. Because we had Nick Lucena there as well. Even Taylor Sander was there. He was there for indoor. Lucena right. was at the Olympics with Jake when he made the calls to me and Trevor. Trevor was on the golf course and threw his back out like 10 minutes before Jake called him. And then Taylor's like in Tokyo prison basically in the hotel room getting oh, fed man. terrible food. And we're all drinking and learning these stories for the first time live on the podcast. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, sometimes you get a big win, right? But you have to just kick it straight on to the next tournament. Yeah. For the people who are out there and they're planning their next tournament, what is the day, if you have a tournament the next weekend, what does the mm -hmm. day after Sunday look like for you? Because a lot of the questions we get is, how do I prepare? How do I rhythm my week? How do I work out for my week? So you won Saturday. Let's say that Chicago was this weekend. You know, you got to celebrate yeah. that Sunday because it's a huge tournament. Right. But yeah. what, what are the next like 48 hours look like? It's going to change a little bit based on where we are at in season. You know, if you're earlier on in season, you're not quite as beat up usually. And then it depends on like what event it is. So like for MBO, we kind of like tried to hit a peak for that one. So we put a lot more in. But I'd say, you know, you take the first day to it's full physical recovery. 
So the body's not doing any work. If anything, you're just recovering. I like to do like ice heat contrast. It just gets the blood flowing. Maybe some, you know, massage is great. I don't like to go too deep that first day because you're already so beat up. And if they do really deep tissue, then it kind of makes you feel even more beat up. And you're like, I need another recovery day. Yeah. So like just light, get the blood flowing, stay active. If you want like spin on the bike for a little bit, you just want the blood flowing because that's what will help you recover fastest. And then, you know, if you're up for it, if, you know, knees aren't hurting, shoulders not hurting too bad, get back out in the sand maybe on Tuesday and just real light reps, easy fundamental reps. Make Because you've played a lot of volleyball already. You don't need to mm -hmm. go compete yet, you know, and uh, or at least for us. So just getting those fundamental reps, light touches, not burning the legs up too much because you're still in that recovery mode. So that means you're then, like digging a lot, passing a lot, setting a lot, but no jump for your Tuesday practice or what? Yeah. Like me and Trevor decided to take Tuesday off this week. So we took Monday and Tuesday off just for pure recovery. I'm at USA Volleyball right now. Mm -hmm. going to jump in the ice bath and sauna and we have massage as well. So we have two full recovery days. And then, but we're also not playing Chicago this weekend. It's the following weekend. So we have some time. Yeah, just a lot of it's mental recovery too, you know. You played a lot that weekend. You're really intense. As you can see on the court, I'm just like so tense and stressed and just like Yeah, you focused. drank a handful of sand. You must have been focused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I that after. Wow. All that monster must I was unconscious. What happened? <laughs> oh, that's what, that, that's what that I keep pulling out of my teeth. You got to decompress mentally because you're going to try to ramp back up and get that adrenaline going back up for another three days the following weekend. So mentally, you have to take off as well. And if you just start competing right again, then you're kind of ramping up a little too early, in my opinion. Some people yeah. like playing more. I'm more of a reps guy. I like getting my reps, my fundamentals, get off the sand. I don't need to go compete a lot. Was uh, that – were you at, always like season. that or was that like a kind of – learn that slash transferred it to yourself from Haydn because Haydn is very show right. up, get the work done, get the hell off the beach. Yes, exactly. I definitely adopted some of it from Haydn. And I think that I learned a lot about myself and what I like while during that period hmm. where I'm like, I actually, I'm really fascinated and stimulated by the simple fundamental reps. I think I've felt how great they are for my game over the years. And so I get more obsessed with it, you know, as I get these small reps, just like I could pass for hours and I only want you to do it one step to the right, one step to the left, just so I can feel the balance and the contact on my platform kind of thing. Like I can get pretty fascinated by that stuff. Yeah. So it's stimulating for me. I remember seeing me. you with Evie, forget what tournament we were at, but you had Evie, your coach, bring you out to just do literally 25 minutes of a step left pass, yeah. like a, a half court float. Yeah. You know, just right. step left pass, step left pass. And yeah. at that time I was like, that's attention to detail. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's, it's like a feel thing for me. I think early on, I, well, first of all, growing up in Hawaii, we had the university of Hawaii coach, Dave Shoji was our coach and pretty much everyone and all the Hawaii coaches were very fundamental oriented. Like we never did hitting or blocking. Like they didn't teach that really. It was just pass and pass and pass and, and <laughs> dig and set sometimes. But it was really about your fundamental passing and that kind of stuff. Because uh, they knew we were kids, hyper kids who wanted to go bounce balls and block and do all that. Like They're like, you're yeah. going to get that. We're going to make true. sure yep. that when you pass, your ball control, it's all ball control. They made sure that we had that down. And I learned that like the value of that. Because when I go out and play, I want to be unconscious. I don't want to be thinking about any fundamentals. So the more I do those fundamentals in practice, the more I can really just step away and be like, I don't have to think about it. That work is done. My body already learned what it feels like. And that's when, when I do those reps, like 25 minutes of just stepping one way or the other, I'm literally just trying to get the feeling. I'm like, oh, that's what it feels like. Oh, that's what it feels like. And you just teach my body over and over until I'm like, okay, if a ball goes there in the game, my body's going to do that. So you that's why I have to remind really yourself of that in the game? So like when you're playing a game and you miss kind of one pass or you know yeah. that a team is about to attack a certain way, do you give yourself a mental or physical cue that you learned during your ball touch sessions or are you just in competition mode blank mind? Right. I think it varies. I do give cues sometimes. It's more when I, if I notice like I keep getting caught high, like, 
okay, I need a cue to fix that. Mm -hmm. If it happens once or twice, it's like, whatever. Like, I know how to pass. Let's not try to convince myself that I forgot how to pass all of a sudden after 10 years, you know? That happens, right? Which I think some some of us do that. You're like, oh my God, I'm, I can't pass this tournament. Yeah. You know, you're just like, no, no, no. That's what it feels like, but it'll come back. You still yeah, remember. Like, ride that statistical um, wave. You're a nine out of 10 passer. Like if you missed two, yeah. that means that your next 18 should statistically be great. You know, so calm down and right, ride that exactly. wave. <laughs> exactly. But I do use cues a lot. And cues like real short little, like stay down, you know, when a ball is catching me high a lot. If I force myself to stay down on it, then I have to move. It makes my feet move or else I'm going to get hit in the face. Right. What do you mean when you say stay Whereas down? Whereas if I stay, like when I'm passing and you're down and serve receive, right? Sometimes the float serves coming a little high to your chest or hitting your elbows. Mm -hmm. And then you start pulling it because you start standing up. Okay. So I like, more of a I want to stay down. Thing. Yeah, yeah, shoulders down. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Not standing up, like bringing your shoulders up. The cue for me is to, to keep the shoulders down, not to move my feet back, even though really what I want myself to do is move my feet back. Uh, but it's easier for me to just stay down and then my body will react. Like if I'm down, I'm going to get hit in the face if I don't move my feet. So it makes me move my feet. But point is, it's just real short little nuggets that, that I think will help me. Or I'll like make the move once mm. before the serve comes and then that kind of like reminds my body what it feels like or just step back beforehand that works too but do you do anything consistently that it pisses you off that your body keeps trying to do that when you know skillfully you should be doing something else like my body has a yeah. tendency or whatever where when i play defense i put my hands kind of like outside my hips or almost behind my knees and then i have to make this big move to the ball like a big mm. macro move and i'm like my hands should be comfortably in front of me just freaking do it body but anytime yeah, i don't pay attention it slides back to that do you have any of those where yep. your body's just like God, why do you always do this 100 percent. i mean i still feel like a total rookie on defense so i've been playing with my hand positioning and all that too but i don't even know what i do in the games because you know i'm like forgetting about it at that point but for sure i know i watch film and right when the kidder contacts i put my hands together like i'm gonna dig the hard driven and then if it comes outside of me when i really just want to leave my hands like you know out in front with some space so if it comes to the right my right arm's kind of already there and i fill in the gap with my left but i still do it hands together and then i swing uh, not all the time, and I think I break the I've broken the habit here and there. But if you watch film, like they're coming together, and blocking too is like I really have taken pride over the years in being able to block separately with my hands not always working in unison. Mm. But here comes that other hand when I see something with, you know, and I start paying attention to one hand. The other hand wants to just float towards it. I'm like, no, stay there, hand. But that's just the reps. It's a feel thing. I've had this talk and study and discussion a lot about like hands coming together in front of the body yeah. on defense because people have always said that you know and they said like hey you know don't start inside like it's going to cause shanks and then when i watch all of the best defenders in the world and the best passers everybody's hands are right there underneath like together yeah. on yeah. contact i have come to the conclusion that this is just a human thing your body's going to move with that it's okay if they come together and this whole like Hands out to your side, bring your left to your right. Gold medal squared coaches told me a while ago, they're like, bodies just don't do that. Just try not to do right. that. And then when I started looking at like Billy Allen and then Nick and then Taylor and seeing when they're playing defense, their hands are here. Mm -hmm. You know, they are yeah. already connected and then they release out of that. So I've, right. to me, I've settled on, I don't really care. Like if your hands are yeah. apart, okay. If they come together, you're still going to make a move. Yeah. I think you're right, to be honest, like I, as much as I try to do it, there's a lot of stuff that we just need to listen to our bodies, like our bodies kind of are smarter than our brains a lot of the times. Mm. And obviously, you can train yourself to do certain stuff. But yeah, there's definitely when a ball comes at you with heat, you're glad that your hands were already together, you know, because you wouldn't have been able to get them together. But then when it's outside, yeah. and you're like, damn, if my hand was already out there, then I would have scooped it with one arm probably. So yeah, I think you're right. There's not really any right or wrong way to go about it, but you just kind of keep tweaking and seeing what works for you really. Yeah, I think that's probably the key is experiment. You know, like learn from somebody yes. else, take their advice, try it. After you've yes. tried it for a significant enough time, then is it working? But it's not like try it for one, two, three reps and be like, well, that doesn't work. It's like, eh, you gotta right. apply this for a week or two and see.
Oh, for sure. Going on. Yeah. Is my camera working, by the way? Yeah. You're all on. Okay, cool. So let's go back to that Tuesday practice, right? You're coming back yeah. now, or for this week, it's going to be Wednesday. Because yeah. I tell people a lot, like, on your Friday before a tournament, Yeah. this is when, okay, get out there for 45 minutes, light touches, you might get 15 jumps. Like, right. that's it. You know, 20, okay. But pass and set, yeah. pass and set. What does a drill look like? If you're diagramming one of your many touch fundamental drills, what exactly are you doing and for how long? Yeah. So, you know, I'm listening to the body, like I said, but like if we go out for an easy practice, we'll maybe go for an hour uh, for one of those easy fundamental practices where we're, we're not jumping and I'll start with passing probably the stuff that you've seen me do one step to the right, one step to the left, maybe a Is little that with a coach back. tossing underhand, hitting at you. Ideally we have a coach in the ideal world. I like to start real, real easy. So I have a coach rolling it, bowling it underhand with some top spin. It's the easiest thing to pass, but I, it's just super easy for me to get my footwork down and just worry about the steps and not really the result of the pass or anything. Because if it's a float, then you know it's going to die six inches or rise up on you. And then you end up having to improvise. And I just want to focus on my feet there. But then we'll get into, you know, depending on the day, we'll, we'll get into those float serves and start applying that footwork to float serves as well. But I start easy with just a bowl and then, you know, have someone catching or if they want to set, if partner wants to get his setting reps there, he'll get his setting reps there. Okay. So and you'll ideally either we have alternate catch- with, with Trevor or he'll yeah, yeah, be yeah. the setter in that. So it's like a triangle, but a really easy, soft, slow triangle. Exactly. Slow, okay. tri- slow, easy triangle. Ideally, you have some help catching and throwing to the coach. and Not all of us do, but yeah, easy, simple triangle. And then the same thing when Trev's passing, I'm working on my setting. Really just trying to get the legs first because it's so easy in those drills to just hand it, you know, just all wrist or, you know, me, we could do anything. We could do it sideways, backwards when it's that easy. But you just, I just try to go, okay, legs. I'm just setting with my legs in the beginning. And then from there, I work on like, you know, make sure I'm following through all the way. Because like I said, when it's that easy, like we could flick it from our chins or from our ear, whatever. Yeah. And still make it get lazy with easy drills. It's exactly such a thing that I think so many people are missing. Like just because you're doing a slow fundamental drill doesn't mean that you move your body slow. It means like this is your opportunity to get the regular stuff flawless not Mm -hmm. just feel your touch and kind of go through it it's like hey you have to figure out the last one percent right now and if you're still Mm -hmm. you know not squaring up or you're not getting your feet around you're not doing your setting footwork whatever it is this is your opportunity to fix it and i think people treat easy drills as easy and that messes them up bad yeah and and it bores them too right but if you're really thinking real intricate in it and you're like legs 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 And then you flick one and it's perfect, but you flicked it, you know, just from your wrists. Like for me, I'm like, damn it, I missed that rep, even though it's a perfect set. Whereas other people are like, oh, that was easy. That was easy. This is boring. I want to play. But for me, it's like, no, perfect with the legs. It's all about legs right now. And then I'm like, it's all about, you know, the follow through, the finish and facing the right direction. And then I'm trying to put it all together at the end. And so it's like a long process. And by the time I get to like the actual nice setting of it's you know we're 15 minutes in would you say that that's kind of like the brazilian theory of training where it's constant repetition until feel because Mm -hmm. a lot of the guys that i've talked to they're like a lot of the brazilian coaches they they don't teach really on technique until right a technique has become a problem you know it's like feel it feel it whatever you're doing just touch it and make sure that it goes the right spot and it feels good for you totally yeah we have the we've i've obviously had jose for four years and now leandro Mm -hmm. so all brazilian coaching me for a long time now and it's a little different than me personally we've had to kind of compromise a little bit because like i think you nailed it spot on it's all about the reps for them just like real good get a hundred reps and dig it to the right spot it's not as like precise and like like, like for me, US, I have like to slow drop them down. Your shoulder, and then like stop your stop your leg. It's just like get it to the spot. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. No, for me, I love breaking it down like super precise. Where mm-hmm. in the beginning, they're like, you know, okay, let's warm up hitting balls at me. I'm like, no, 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 that's too hard. I want you to bowl it just to my right foot. They're like, wait, what? Like that's so easy. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> just try. This is what I want. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think I'm a little more. I like to slow it down. I like to start really 
really easy. Like if I was playing basketball, I would be starting from two feet from the rim, you know, and working on a shot. Nice. And once I make that, take a step back, which I did. I did to see um, Steph Curry's master class, and he does that too. Oh, so I maybe check I stole that out. a little bit. Yeah. Oh, it's sick. Really? Um, you, yeah. You just try to like kind of see what he does, and then transfer that to volleyball. It's really easy to transfer it over. You see what he's doing, like. Hmm. But he doesn't. He he never walks out on the court and starts bombing threes. He starts inside. If he doesn't, he makes it. Step back. Makes it. Step back. He has to like earn it to get all the way out to his range. Mm. But that's because by the time he gets out there, his fundamental, his foundation of his shooting, where it's from the legs with the toes, follow through with the fingers, it's all just so solid that the power, like he doesn't have it, the whole body's working as one. And it's easy. That's how I think. And that's what like fascinates me and makes me feel good about my game. But there's not always time for that either. That's the now, crazy part. Yeah, people don't. Because let's say that you only had, because you, you live on a, on a professional athlete's schedule, right? And now you got yeah. your family. So there's like a little bit of added time that you need to and right. want to take away from volleyball. But it's still, yes. you get the opportunity for like five or six hours that can should be dedicated to volleyball in some way in some version oh for sure for sure but for people who have family full-time job kids and they're like yes. scratching to get their two-hour league night what should that person do to feel right. a little bit more accomplished you know should it be those slow reps for just showing up 10 minutes early and getting those slow reps or should right. they be doing hitting lines like i saw yesterday just guys doing hitting lines i'm like guys you're not getting any better from just no. hitting lines yeah, no. stop this <laughs> <laughs> i love it when people are like just like bouncing balls and hitting lines I'm like huh low hitting low seam huh that's, your, <laughs> that's the thing you're gonna work on right now <laughs> and like especially if i'm playing that person i'm like perfect like the one thing they have warmed up is hitting low seam the easiest ball right. to block or dig <laughs> right it's gonna land right um, at three quarters depth and you're just like all right Man, I haven't seen yeah. hitting lines. I know this is a side note, but uh, yesterday I went out and got some reps with a couple of guys that are like kind of open double A. There's one one A player there, and I'm there doing like my warm up and everything. It was like 25 minutes of them just toss to the setter, setter hit back, pass set hit, and I was just like, I haven't seen this in a decade. You know, I I remember <laughs> that like when I was young, like I went out there and and I and I said, yeah, hitting right. lines. This is how we warm up. But oh, for sure. The guys that we play against, it's just like, what? Just straight hitting lines? Like you're not perfecting a pass right. or a set or anything? No, yeah, it's. I honestly, I f feel like I've forgotten how to like bounce a ball. Like people see, you know, I I hit the ball harder these days for sure than I used to. But like bouncing a ball, like we used to do it as kids, because we're just all egotistical and we want to bounce it. Yeah. Not that we don't try to do it now, but I can't. I can't really do it as well anymore because my footwork, my arm work, isn't meant for it. So, like, I can never, like, bounce straight down like Casey does, you know? Yeah. I'm like, what, what is going on? But I feel like I'd have to retrain myself to actually approach in a way that would allow me to hit straight down. And what would be the value? And, like? and I don't. And I don't want yeah. that. There'd be no value in that for me. I just want to hit high and, like, off-speed corners. If I bounce something, it's going to be sharp, you know, not right in the pocket. Yeah. Or it'll be, like, you know full cross body where I show one thing, go the other. And that's the only times I want to bring the ball low. Other than that, I'm trying to cuff high or rip high hands corner or, you know, or go off speed, all, all the whole off speed game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a side note for sure. We have one guy in our well, class who's just like bouncing and taping. I was just like, dude, just hammer the back line. I go, if any of your balls land in the front three quarters, I go, you failed for this hitting drill. And all of a sudden he just starts boom he stopped netting stopped taping started like reaching higher naturally and Dude, just nobody gosh, and nobody like, this is a point score no one know? defends the bat the corners the corners is <laughs> indoor or beach the corners mm -hmm. are just wide open all the time pretty much and even when you know they're hitting there as a defender you feel way too far back so yeah. it's like even if they know it's going there that it's really hard if someone's if i hit a deep corner and someone's sitting right in that corner i'm like okay they just gave me way too much cut like if they play this the whole game i'm just gonna drop this thing until they inch closer to the mm -hmm. cut and then i'm going back at that corner yeah. so yeah that's a easy win plus 
if they block it, it's probably going to be soft blocked or, you know, coverable for you. It's just way safer, way better bet. It's so interesting um, to hear you say that because you do that well. I got one more. I mean, when we've played against each other, you've diced me up by hitting that sharp 70, 80 percent angle, yeah. like right on the half court on that far sideline. Mm-hmm. So you have the ability to keep it so steep, but you also don't, your body doesn't slow down when you do it. Your arm doesn't slow right. down. You just get, I don't know, more on top. Your yeah. wrist gets on top and then you beat that up and then like, okay, I'll step out there. And then it's a flick high line or a high hard seam. And it's like, all right, now I'm dancing. Yeah, yeah. right. And you're still hitting angle, right? So it's not like, yeah. oh, oh, we know tries hitting angle and I have to worry about it. Damn, they know I'm coming angle. Like, well, but what kind of angle? And like right. y- you guys will come as defenders, you'll come and creep on that, that off speed cut of mine. Mm. And if they get one, then I'm like, okay, I'm not worried about it because they had to go real far to get that thing. And now I'm stretching them. I'm stretching that defender. They opened up my whole line or still my deep angle. Mm-hmm. And I know they're not comfortable there. Yeah, I mean, I worked on that shot forever. That's kind of, in terms of my checklist, I'd like that to be available, which is not mm-hmm. available all the time. But with my approach and, and my set that I take, I want that to be available. And then it's kind of like, I just go from there. If the blocker's too far in the line, then I just have options. You know, then I just look yeah, at the yeah. defender and... If they cut on, if they creep on that cuff, then I'll just blow them up. And if they don't, then I'll just slap it down real quick. Mm-hmm. But it, it's hard. It's really hard. That that one, that shot is like you said. You can't drop your elbow. You can't show it. It's just a hit, and you're hitting the side of the ball, and you're trying to make no upward movement on it. So it's not a shot. It's like a slow hit. It's just a slap down. Yeah, like a like get 70, it to the, like, it's like when you're warming up, but you still want to hit down. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, get it to just, that's how I think about it. It's like, get this ball to the sand as fast as possible without hitting it. Just like slap it down there. And and then you're kind of just spreading your fan of where the defender has to play. Yeah. And once I kind of establish that, some people aren't comfortable going all the way to it. So then I'll just keep doing it. And keep doing it. Like you're gonna have to step on it at some point, or bring your right. defender or your blocker all the way over, and then that's just too much line, <laughs> you know. But the problem is, like, it sounds really easy, right? But good luck getting that set that where you can contact it high and above the net enough to where you have that angle and not far enough inside. Because if it's too far in, then you don't have the angle start. You start losing it, and that's when I make errors. Is when I force it when I'm already lost that angle. Yeah. And when you but, try to like um, dice it too much or you put like too much fancy spin on it instead of pat down, you know, but you have to have exactly, you definitely have to have a certain amount of vertical, certain amount of height to be able to accomplish right. that. Yeah, exactly. That has to be there consistently so that, because if, if you yeah. hit that shot once, you're not going to pull a defense over there. It's that third time where the right. diggers like, God, all right, I'm going to jump on this this time, you know? Yes. And yeah. exactly. so once doesn't count. Like everybody can hit any shot once, right? But establishing it allows you to then create a much more versatile Mm -hmm. offense. Right. Yep. Because then they're having to react to you. Mm -hmm. They're not, the defense isn't really dictating what happens. They're making moves based on what you've set up. And now you get to choose where you go from there kind of thing. But yeah, let's, why do we practice the fundamentals? So we can get (laughs) to the point where we're contacting the ball where it's possible to hit that shot. If everyone yeah. just goes out there and does that, but you can't pass, you're not even going to have the opportunity to hit that. When I see players like practicing swinging and they just bomb away, like we talked about, like hitting lines, I go, look at Steph Curry, look at Kobe Bryant, who have told you that they've spent hundreds of hours yeah. shooting right. nothing but free throws. That's one shot. Right. Right. Now, every yeah. other shot, they've also practiced that. And it's in a row. It's not just yeah. moving around constantly, chucking things at backboards. It's sitting there from one spot dialing it and if you have never yeah. spent enough time to say i'm gonna hit the same ball 20 times today if you've never done that with your game or your practice you're simply not going to improve because you can't find what that feels like or, or maybe you won't have the confidence to do it because you don't know and understand yeah. every bit of the feeling i completely agree i think that takes us back to like our original point here which was like how can you get those reps right like maybe some people who are doing it after or going out and playing after work are just don't have the time to get those reps or whatnot. But even if it's small, like what I would do is, and I do, I do do this because I like to get these reps. I call it calibration, right? Mm-hmm. Jose Loyola loves that word now. He just, he laughs at me. He's like, what? Try, you're going to go calibrate today? 
<laughs> and that's all it is. It's just like I would come maybe 30 minutes early or even 10, 15, or even just five minutes where I step out on the court and I start hitting shots, just trying to hit target, trying to get a good contact on my hand. Every day I'm kind of working on something different. It might be a serve. I'm not even standing on the back line. I'm not jumping. Let's say I'm working on a serve. I start halfway in the court, standing on the ground, and I'm just tossing and trying to contact high, follow through in the right direction, not even really worried about the target yet. Okay. And then once I get that follow through in the contact, Okay, now I'm trying to get it at the target, just down the line. And then I do the same thing, but I change my contact point a little bit. Now I'm hitting straight down the middle, trying to hit the buckle. And then I'm trying to go cross court. And then I'll do that from this, from the other serving position on the other side of the court, if I have time, you know, in the middle too. But that really takes, let's say you hit five in each side, that's 30 swings total. You can get that done in five to 10 minutes. Well, if you have the balls if or If you got or the ball bag, there. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the problem. If you don't have a coach like throwing them back to you or you have ball bag and then you have to go shag it. But even if it's one cart and every time you go out, you get one cart in before you play, mm. those reps are going to be huge and they're going to stack up over the years right? Or, or over the season or whatever it is. You, if you showed up five minutes before everyone starts, you're always out there, what I call calibrating, for five minutes. By the end of the year, you're going to be better fundamentally and you're going to be playing better volleyball you sure. have hours more focused reps on certain things than somebody else exactly. people don't i think april ross was the first one who said something like that she goes think about massage and foam rolling she goes i'm gonna do it even if i could do it two three five or ten minutes but even if i do it two or three right minutes add up and by the end of the year with me foam rolling two to three minutes a day i've got a few hours that's hours of massage that i've given my right. body over the year. So she's like, it counts. Yeah. If you can just get it in a little bit, then when you annualize mm -hmm. things, it always like makes it look bigger. And you're like, oh, that's actually really impressive. But two minutes at a time doesn't yeah. seem impressive. So then you don't give it any importance. So you don't do it when you think, well, if I, I just multiplied yeah. this times 365, what would that mean? Yeah, no, that's a great way to look at it. I really like that actually. And with foam rolling and stuff, it's like, okay, there's 100% of this tension. In two minutes, I got rid of, let's say, 15% of it only. But now you're walking around with 15% less of that tension in your body. And when you have tension in one place, it gets, it moves up your entire chain of your body. And so think about that in 365 days of how much less time you're spending with tension pulling you in different directions and like how much less injured you can be by the end of the year. How much do you go through massage and, and fall? Well, I mean, I remember when we are in the hotel in Brazil, I was just like, man, this guy doesn't stop hip flexor stretches. It was just like on your bed, oh, it was yeah, just yeah, nonstop yeah. hip flexor and hip openers. And I was just like, it's been yes. like an hour and a half and he's still going. I was like, all right, I guess I'll do some. <laughs> You're like, I'm getting a little uncomfortable here with these uh, hip thrusts. He's Keeps doing. thrusting over on his bed. No, oh. <laughs> I did that a lot and I still do it. That's like probably the one thing that I took from college. Cause when I was younger, I was, didn't have as much muscle and I had a lot of back problems. Uh, um, I had I had to get two epidurals because of herniated discs that I had in college. Two and then epidurals. I was, yeah, if my second epidural didn't work, I was gonna have to get surgery on it, and it ended up working. But one of the things that like I always noticed worked right away was my hips. If if my hips get tight, my lower back starts seizing up. Okay. So that like put in my head like I don't want this lower back stuff and it just made it a habit and it's just similar to what we were just talking about. I'm just going to do it every day. Not when my back hurts. This is just my nightly routine. This is my warm up routine. Even though it looks really funny the ones that I do. I just committed to it years ago. Like I'm going to do my hip mobility exercises every day. It's part of my warm up and my before I go to sleep. And that's what you were saying. It's just me. It wasn't even my back hurting. It was just this is what I do before I go to sleep, and I still do it, like, what, 10 years later? Man, it's crazy how much the hips, the hip flexors, and being in the sitting position, how much damage it does to your vertical, and then over time, just, like, the back injuries. If, if yep. people added a little bit of glute activation and lots of just all hip openers... 10 minutes a day, like there go oh, yeah. your back problems. They'd be gone. And, and I know for me, when I'm doing that on a regular basis, I'm golden. And then all of a sudden I let it slide because you feel like, you know what? It hasn't bothered me. I haven't felt any tightness. And then you don't keep committing. And then it comes back and like, shoot. And then the pain yep. reminds you instead of it just never being there. Yeah, exactly. You know? 
That's why I like doing creating routines and stuff like your warm ups. When I have something big that I learn, like with the trainers, they're like, dude, you keep locking up here because there's this and that. I'm like, okay, boom, added to my warm up. So now it becomes a daily thing. It's not like, okay, I'll go do that today. It's like, no, that's something that's going to be added to the routine daily or my night routine. I do a stretching before I go to sleep and then I, you know, I try to stretch after practice too, but warm up routine, which includes a lot of mobility stretch just stretch after practice and then before i go to sleep i do a, a stretching routine how long but is yeah, your stretch routine before bed is it like a 10 15 minute thing nah, i'd say uh, i mean some days i just enjoy it a lot like it actually yeah. puts me to sleep hmm. like you guys should try it like go and do like a real deep nice stretch where you're like breathing and like present with your muscles right because you're trying to feel it you're trying to feel where where the tension is and really get in there that's actually like a very mindful thing to do. You're kind of meditating because yeah. you're feeling something and you're trying to pay attention to that. You're not like daydreaming about something else. You're like, I'm trying to get right where it hurts here and put my hip here and my knee. It's very, it's kind of a meditative thing. And then when you lay down and you're all stretched out, you're like, oh, that feels pretty good. And then you just pass out. Hmm. So I've made it part of my routine in that way for that reason as well. No. But and it's it, not that far yeah. from your couch right to your floor. It's like, just sit on the totally. floor and just no, do, I do this. It, uh, I do it on my, on my bed, actually. And I keep a <laughs> stretching strap right uh, I keep a uh, stretching strap right next to my bed as well. So what a good idea. Know. That's such an yep. easy fix. Like I leave it right dude, on the nightstand. Knock one nail in in your wall, leave the stretching strap there, and then exactly. at least it's easy to do these things. Setting up your Yeah, you're already easy. laying there. You're just like, I don't want to stretch. But then it's like, I could just grab this strap and just pull my hammies. <laughs> then you at least feel good about yourself a little bit. Some days I'm literally so tired. I'm like, I make myself do it, but it'll be two minutes. And then other days it just feels good to just do it for 15. But I'd say average uh, five to 10 minutes. Nice. What do you think is one thing that you thought you were doing right early in your career mm -hmm. that now you know or now you think, man, I shouldn't have done that. Like that was what people were telling me to do and that's what I was trying to do but I was way off. Oh, that's a really good question. Well, first of all, with defense, I blocked for so many years. And I played a lot. Like I said, I grew up being uh, passing and defensive oriented, ball control oriented. So I was always like, I can defend, I can defend. But I never got the reps. And when I got out there, I was like, wow, this is really hard. Like, I'm not that good at defending. <laughs> so there was a ton of stuff that I, if I had gone out there alone, I would have done it a certain way. And then I got reteached by, you know, Jose, or whatever. I actually, Mike Dodd, I had helped me a bunch, uh, a bunch of people over the years of some coaches back in Hawaii, whoever I could learn from. But defense is like everything. I, I kind of had to relearn and recalibrate. But other things like arm swing alone, I switched my arm swing up so I could get more velocity on it when I was around the time when you and I we're starting out. I came out in like 2012, 2013. We went to New Zealand. Oh, yeah, New Ze I was just coming back from Puerto Rico playing indoor. And I was like, I have to learn how to hit hard because mm. I don't hit hard enough. I'm supposed to be the foreigner that gets like 30 kills a match. And I'm more of a ball control outside two guy. Yep. I was trying to contact the ball way out in front of me more, which helped me get more gas on it. But it made my point of contact really low when I was like reach straight up 12 o'clock contact mm. point kind of guy. But I couldn't get heat from there. So I kind of brought that out. And how did you uh, fix it? So you were starting to get velocity and now you're but trying then I to lost, stay higher. I lost the height okay. that I had. My height was good. So I came out and then I was trying to work on just getting my arm further back as well so that oh, I could create okay. more space. And that seemed to work for me for a few years. And then I went with the Brazilians and they were like, don't worry about getting your arm back as much. Just worry about snapping high. Just that mm -hmm. good high snappy contact. And I was like pretty against it for like the first six months. Like, no, like I want to create space so I can bring it in and, and bring gas. He's like, your body's going to, his theory was your body's going to bring it, cock it back to where it needs to be when you right, decide. Right, because if you're snapping up, you have to have that space naturally to. You need it, right. It's but when I'm training, he just wants like that contact point and that being really high. And when I finally gave into it, I was like, damn, my high line's way flatter now. Like hmm. guys can be running on it and I'll still beat them to the line, you know? Yep. And that's so valuable. When I look at like the great shooters, 
you know, Kent Steffes, John Hyden's high line, which obviously it's gotten lower over the these last few years, but he, he has one of the best high lines. Trevor actually has one of the best high lines. They're all really fast and quick in the high mm-hmm. contact point. People and always confuse I, like fast and quick, right? Because when people say, it's, you know, you need to speed up your arm, you need to speed up your arm. I think a lot of players, like then they start hitting hard instead of you just uh-huh. have to get maximal speed from where you're loaded until the face of the ball. It's yeah, just yeah, so yeah. like, imagine you're in a fight and you kind of slow motion punch somebody. Right. As soon as you slow your punch down, somebody steps out of the way, they block it, and then and then you're done. And that's what happens, yeah. and that's what makes people easy to read. So you're saying yeah. that like from that loaded position, as fast as you can to the ball, but you don't necessarily yeah. need to follow through. Because no, 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 my no, vision of not. you is like you pound a ball and your wrist is still yeah. hanging up in the air. And I'm like, see, yeah, you don't need to be. follow through, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it changes a lot. I also saw like a golf coach the other day. Being like, okay, here's how you hit two different flight patterns, and one of them was they were the same, similar shot, but one of them just didn't have a follow through, and it gave the ball a different flight pattern, like a bump and run versus chip under and be- get backspin on it or whatever. Mm. And I was like, that's weird. Like it's just about the follow through. When you play pool, they say if you don't want the ball to follow through right and and go in scratch mm-hmm. to follow the ball into the hole, you just tap it and pull back. Right. And it actually makes the ball hit it and stay. And it works. And it's kind of similar with volleyball. Like you're just trying to hit it. Like it's almost like get your hand off the ball. The time that you're on the ball, like don't make it long. I like that. Oh, that's a good Um, little little key. Yeah. That's kind of how I think about it a little bit. And then with the high lines, like if I was teaching a player nowadays, let's say I'm teaching my kid how to play from scratch, I would never say shoot a high line anymore. Because in their head, it's like this loopy. I used to do these loopy. As long as it hits the target, it's a perfect high line. Mm. Now I'm like, no, that's not perfect. It has to be as wherever the block is or, you know, you have to go higher. But I want that thing in the corner as fast as possible. That's the best high line. If the block's huge, okay, it's going to have to be higher. It might have to loop a little bit. But the best high line guys, are they're hitting high lines. They're not shooting high lines. So hit your shots. And that also makes you not drop your elbow and not think about this loopy, anything it's really you're trying to drop the ball if you're going short you're trying to drop it yes you have to go over the block sometimes yes some people are shorter and that is going to be a loopy right not everyone can reach whatever i'm reaching but i would just say everything's you're hitting a hit a shot just don't hit it as hard hit a high line hit a cut shot don't shoot it just because i think the word shoot makes you go loopy yep yeah people think shots shot shots you know you see these indoor guys who can pound i remember Kind of, I'm not taking anything away from him, but like Robbie Page came out at at seven yeah. foot one, and I was seeing Theo, and I was seeing Robbie, and Theo goes high line, and he slaps down, it's downward trajectory yeah. over you high line, and Robbie yes. came out to the beach, and was doing like cut shots that rolled twice yep. the height of the antenna. I go, why are you exactly hitting a cut? You should just go sharp angle. You're too big. Exactly. And then Taryn Close, she to me, is the first big girl that has used her height the right way and obviously Uh the right way. Like her high Uh line is a slap down. Her cut shot is not a cut shot. It's a chop angle. Right. You know, and I'm like, that's how you play when you have that height. And okay. If you don't have the height, then just calibrate that same thing though, to wherever you're at. Mm. So yeah, you're shorter. Okay. It's going to have to be loopier maybe to go over, but everyone usually goes a little higher than they need to. So it's basically play it as fast and low and get that thing to the sand as quick as you can. Yeah. A nice high, like cuff, drop your elbow, loopy cut shot. That feels really good. It doesn't get to the sand fast enough. That's literally the goal. Get the ball to the sand as fast as possible with what the defense is giving you. Hand to sand fast. Yeah. Hand to sand fast. Exactly. That's the whole game. And like Theo, I think is one of the, smartest guys in terms of like he completely knows he's like i'm tall i'm not gonna bring the ball down low with you guys like Mm -hmm. it's very clear to me whereas there's so many guys that are touch as high as him that just are too stubborn or too dumb i guess to to figure it out (laughs) and i love it because i'm you know six five blockers especially on the world tour is not very big and i just love it when those big guys come down and play with me because if they don't i'm like this is just so frustrating Sometimes I think that that comes, maybe that comes from the fact that there's a bunch of six one, six two, six three guys who are coaching 
some of the world's best and tallest and highest jumping athletes. And so they mm. like kind of do what they did. And they're like, look, you put right. that little bit of spin on it. We need yeah. for the seven footers. We need more seven footers who have done it at that level saying like, right. This, this is how you play a big man's game. You know? Exactly. Ideally yeah. you have the coach who can like, actually see that without needing the experience. But the six, one, six, two guys has to think about it. If, if he was playing on a girl's night, like, yeah. would you still play that same game or would you just slap everything down to the sand as fast as possible? Probably do the second. Do you think shorter players should set tighter and lower or should they set more off? <laughs> Like, is there, do you think that there is a prime height or distance from the net for no. shorter players? No, I don't think so because I think it's got to change. Dude, set a short player tight with a big block. Good luck. That's going to be tough with a good big block. Obviously, some short players are great with the block. Like, they can see it so well because it's so big and in front of them. But that's like those big dumb blocks too. There's mm -hmm. some big dumb blocks where, hey, go put me up there. I'm down. I want to challenge them all day. I'll tool them. I'll go under them. I'll go through them. But then there's the big smart blocks. And you're like, no, let's stay back and make them move their feet now. Because as I come off the net, now the angles change for them. And they can't or just smother me from one place. Yeah. Pull it off the net. Maybe push it an extra foot outside, an extra foot inside. Now you're adding footwork in for them. And it's hard for blockers to move their feet. Not all of them do it. So it can um, work well against a certain level of blocker. But then once well, that yeah, figure out blocker what... increases, then it's like it's not going to work against this guy anymore. Yeah, but it also like, for example, I'm on the world tour. If I play Phil, he eats me up when I'm set too tight. And if I just come in barreling because he can just take so many angles, right, with just one simple block. So I can pull it off. I've, I've pulled it off at times and had a lot of success going around him under over because now I just – made so many more things for him to worry about but then it's like funny let's people say, think that when they're set tight they think that they have more angles you well, know you have more angles to the cut sand, off more though yeah but when you're set off the blocker has a wider fan from the ball the blocker has a wider fan to deal with if you really think about the angles from the net from the ball to the sidelines if you step off the net that fan gets bigger for the blocker to be able to touch both sides of that fan yeah if you get tighter he can touch the whole fan with two hands right there on top right. of the ball. It's like if I had a flashlight behind my hand and I were showing it to the screen, Exactly. you know, I'm this tight, so no light comes out. But the further away exactly. I go, the more you can see kind of exactly. lights. Exactly. Yeah. You need you need to see light when you have a field <laughs> of Yeah. If, or else you're just going to be playing in the dark all day. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so, but you got to switch it up because like, okay, so I'm still on the world tour, but then I go against uh, Ivandro. No offense, Ivandro, but... Just as big of a block, but not nearly as good. <laughs> like hand positioning, skills, joust, you know, sealing the low angles. So that, a small guy might want to go tee off against that. Go through him, challenge him, joust him, you know, a less skilled block maybe. You might want to do that. So there's not like a certain one thing fits all. And then it might be that particular day where the defense is setting up well on the tight ball. Because that's going to change what the defender does as well. So they're on you. They're on that beat of you setting tight. They both on that same timing. Now you're setting it off and it throws them off. Yeah. So you changed it up. And if they have a beat on you, then that's a great change. I remember Casey Jennings was like, I forget who he was playing with, but he was playing against Ryan Darty, and he mm -hmm. wanted to challenge those angles. So he told his partner, exactly. like, set me at 10 feet, 11 feet. He goes, I'm going to tempt him to peel. And if he doesn't peel, like I'm going to oh. sizzle him, you know? So he... He exactly. took a look at the big guy and he's like, set me even further off the net because some big guys mm -hmm. might be good blockers or take up a lot of space, but they might be terrible. I mean, I think most people are terrible at peeling. Yes. But terrible at peeling. So it's just like, hey, if I get him to leave, then I don't even have to deal with it. All I have to do is hit a medium ball at his head. He's going to gaff it. That's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like a Doherty that can seal a lot of space. But if he's dropping, you like your odds, you know, mm -hmm. or if he's even way off. He's not like his he's seeing you and making real fast hand movements at the net. So if you're far off, he's kind of just posting up there and you can tee off of him and go around him. He's not going to be like diving, like stuff that I'm doing, being like shifty and tricky and getting really low and disappearing for a second. So yeah, Casey's great. So that's a perfect example. All right. I know you got recovery. So just 
two last questions, and I, and I want to pick your brain yeah, for, for blockers and defenders. But from the adjustments that you've made coming up the ranks and things that you kind of thought you had to do, because you did say on defense, but I kind of want to lock you into one specific movement or position or mindset or vision that you really had to adjust in the last five years of mm. what fix specifically did you make on defense that you think would be really valuable to all of the upcoming juniors, Bs, As, double As? Okay, yeah, I've learned so much. I learned something like literally Manhattan here. The last you know two matches or so, I, I feel like I something clicked for me a little bit with something my coach has been working on with. Mm. So like the two last matches, I've learned something now. I'm always learning. There's always more to learn. And that was just starting deeper in the court, being comfortable starting closer to the sidelines and then mm -hmm. moving my weight forward. Because all these years when I was working with my other coach, it was more lateral movements. And we'll kind of start here, go there, and it was lateral. But I, I couldn't stay balanced enough to where I felt comfortable and on my toes where I could break out of it easily. My current coach moved me back and made me move a lot along the sidelines with my back to the sideline. And I'm like, I feel so far back here. Like, the ball comes at me it's out like this feels weird but then i started like creeping in forward and my vision was better and then if my weight's forward and i see a high line now i'm my weight's already forward and i'm on my balls my feet mm. so now i can break for that easily whereas if i'm doing a lateral movement and i'm just shuffling directly sideways i'm kind of burned and so that's been that was huge and even for the hard driven i'm kind of ah because you're kind of when you go sideways you're also in a way kind of going backwards and then that creates like a big pivot it. or you're pushing off your heel or something so it when you chase that high line backwards. you're chasing backwards you're not as fast but if the high line is still yes. kind of in front of you then you get that toe exactly. drive exactly exactly and i even talked to dodd yesterday i saw him at breakfast and i told him that he's like your defense looks way better it's coming along and i was like yeah like i've been working on staying back and finally figured out how to get my weight forward and he's like your weight being forward will make you go backwards faster. I'm like, mm. wow, that's interesting. <laughs> and and I totally feel it. So that's something I'm working on right now. I've only really been applying, able to apply it well for the last two matches. Um, it's paranoid, right, too? Two good then, ones. Like, you feel like you're opening up that cut shot or you're too far away yeah. or somebody's going to bounce a couple balls in front of you. And then when they do that, you, you get that mindset like, man, should I have been tighter than that? Should I have been a little bit tighter? Right. But then if yeah, you're getting that steep, moving forward. Yeah. So like me standing two feet back is just as with two feet backwards with my weight forward is I can get to the same cut shot as me standing two feet forward, but my heels are neutral or, or my weight's back and I can still break for that high line. And then if it comes high, hopefully I'm good with my hands where I can bring them up, but I'm far enough back where I don't really need to worry about like, you know, you get in that tweener zone where you don't know if your hands should be up or down. Yeah. You're getting throated. Yeah. But when you're deep, you're just kind of committed to it being, you're getting throated. Yeah. Yeah. You're kind of committed to them just being down, and it just helps me commit a lot. I like that. When, I, so when that, you say that, it makes me thing. think of like Sorum. I feel like he well, always exactly. kind of starts really far back, and then Nick as well Nick? starts like his heels on yes. the on the back line and serve receive and in defense. And you're like, how are and you still charges getting you all these on defense? He's yeah. he's charging at you while playing defense, and I was always like, like now I'm looking back to like, why am I only realizing that now? Like Nick's <sighs> been doing it this whole time. Like why didn't I try it? And, and it's then, still a work in progress, you know. The juking is different too because the defender is still moving. So offensively, you're still not quite sure where they want to be, but it's less of mm -hmm. this like shoulder bob side to side. And now they can walk into whatever position they yes. want to be in. And it still makes you sort of insecure as, a, as an offensive player. Yeah. Hmm. Think about like taking a diagonal step forward isn't really throwing you off balance and then changing like your center line too much. You're still there ready to dig. You took a step diagonally forward and then you replace that foot and now you're still kind of in the same spot forward whereas if you took a step sideways you're fully like changing your center line your balance and now you have to rebalance yeah or fall i, I don't know that's how it feels for me no yeah. i'm and feeling that exact same all time, thing with but... mine because for me it's always it yeah. came from like libero mentality right like yes. i belong on 12 Ooh. feet just wearing it so this is where i should be yeah, no. driven balls 
And then, like I said, it's just getting piled. And so I've, it hasn't really worked yet this year, but I, I keep like drawing a line at half court in the court and saying, stay behind this freaking line. Like stop trying right. to go in and get hit with the ball instead of digging it. Like I right. was getting hit with balls, but I wasn't digging them. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a work in progress, but I kind of like that one a lot as of late. Yeah, nice. Okay. And then that's a great one, chasing that as well. But I like starting that far back and then like almost approaching in or doing that little step hop forward as a defender, something yeah. like that. Okay. As a base blocker, you know, we talk about ones and twos. I think everybody knows that you have to take your line with your right hand, you know, take the seam with your inside hand if you're blocking cross. But is there any sort of detail that you could give that you think most amateur CBVA, AVP America players or just all the Friday and Saturday guys that they're not right. doing in their basics of blocking that you've gone so far into the weeds with your head and your training. Yeah, I'm so far into the weeds with it. It's so complicated. <laughs> or, you know, it can be. There's so many intricacies that you can get into, which I love. Well, first of all, like you said, the, there's the line block. Your right hand, let's say you're on the right side and your right hand, your outside hand's on the ball. Your left, your other hand hopefully isn't too close and it's, if you could it's, translate uh, or say in a totally different way, hand on the ball, because I've heard that a lot. And uh, I feel like to somebody new or even five years in, they're like, what does that mean? Do yeah, you have a different you way to say that? Anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like, are you cutting off a certain there. space behind you? Are you thinking what's behind yeah, you? Yeah, I think I'm thinking, I think I'm thinking of the space behind me. Like I feel where the line is and I'm drawing a line from the ball to that line, the sideline, and okay. I'm making sure that my line hand is just in it and shaping back either down or towards the court, into okay. the court. That would be me being on the ball. Or if mm. they hit it at the line, let's say three-fourths of the way back, like let's pick that point. Okay. Three-fourths of the way back to the back line, to the corner, like that would be my line hand. And then my other hand is going to be around shoulder width and this is with like a normal set and just taking some of that seam so not letting them hit too much seam but there's an opposite of that which is now I'm setting up my seam hand where I'm really know that I want to take a lot of that seam take a lot of the court from my partner that's my first priority and I'm pressing with that and then I'm leaving my other hand dragging a little bit in that low line what scenario would so you for do me that, that if somebody's like burying cross a lot. Yeah. So okay. hitters that love hitting angle, you're just creeping on them. They're like, this guy's just not giving me too much space. Like, and then they're thinking, is he going to dive on it or not? But the whole time I'm blocking one, but I'm just creeping in on your space angle and making sure that you don't slime one down the line. But it's opposite for me. It's both one block, but I'm just creeping into your space, making sure you don't hit any low seams and I'm pressing in the angle, but then leaving that line hand in the low line so you don't get that easy slap back because that's still a priority but for me though that's two different the same line block but two different ways to do it what the first one you're really just sealing a big line just meet if they hit it hard if they hit it high you'd probably be able to touch it and it'd be harder to go high line on that one and they could maybe hit a high seam on your seam hand because that's going to be a little lower and then opposite is you're taking a lot of meat with your seam hand and taking a little more low on your line hand. They might hit a little quicker high line, but they won't get that low line down on you. So for like, I think it's just mentality. Like don't get too, it's, you can get way too into the hand placement and all that, but just think like, I'm going to still block line, but I'm going to put pressure on this guy's angle. I or like that because the automatic I'm switch is just line. a two, right? People are like, oh, right. cross, so the next version I have is a two. And it's like, the only exactly. choice you have left is a four. It's like, there's a couple other different angles that you yes. can do this without needing to sprint your defender to the line or knock them out of there or get exactly. them all shaky. Dude, I this Manhattan Beach Open we just won. Uh, last four sets, I called ones the whole time. And it probably didn't look like I was calling ones, right? I blocked a few angles and did a, a bunch of different stuff in there. Mm -hmm. Well, we had some scenarios where we set up, if he goes there, here's our call, but if he does that, then you go angle. So a few times, I guess I, we had a different call. But my point is, my job was the one the whole time. I was just giving them different looks within it. And that really messes with people. And they think you're making changes, but really you're just like, I'm still taking my court. So you don't have to get too crazy into that. But if your digger's not digging the hard driven that well, then maybe creep in on that seam a little bit and make that hitter think twice. Or if they miss hit it, you're going to block it. But you're still not blocking angle. And then think about opposite with the two. You can get outside, get really far into the right. You go really far. You set up that inside hand. Let's say we're blocking the right sider and I'm stepping inside blocking two. So my inside hand is the left and I set that one up big and strong. And then I work 
my way back with my right hand into that seam to help okay. my to not let them hit that low seam or i do the opposite where i set up big on that seam with my right hand and i'm just pressing big into the court and going low for that lower angle hit okay it's the same thing we're talking about on the line where you're just not giving the same look this one of them it's like they're not going to hit angle because you're so far in it that you know that right when they see you they're like okay well i'm not hitting angle look how far he is into the angle yeah so that allows you to re kind of work your way back and just like be like i know he's not going to hit angle now because i have it sealed right here so mm -hmm. i can work my way back with my inside hand and then vice versa is where you're like kind of in the seam and you're pressing big with that so they question whether your other hand's going to be in that mm. sharper angle i don't know that's just to me like simple things that people can think about like a one and a two can be you can do a lot within that and then right. of, of course the delay right so delay so wait this is something jump. i really want to talk about What's like because I, I think i think most players especially after working with rich lamborn and he was like showing me some mm -hmm. tape on jake and tape on on andy and he was just like look mm -hmm. how late they're jumping like if you show somebody that you're definitely in their line they won't try to challenge you hard line so right. it's almost like exactly. you're wasting space by penetrating there maybe mm -hmm. now if you show them early and you know that they feel you in their line maybe this is the time to, to do a delay and, and reach up and try to like just touch a high line as high as you can or how do you think about that yes no that's i think that's a great way to put it there are certain times where you know the blocker sees you and feels you and they like okay i know that you're taking that. So which as a blocker, now I'm like, well, now I don't need to take that. Mm. So I can reach outside my body line or I can reach up and like give up that easy shot that they could be hitting because I know that they're not dumb enough to take it, you know, yeah. or do that Ricardo step back and slap type thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's when guys get you, they make you look dumb where, you know, you hit like a baby line and they dropped or, or they did a full delay and you're like, you're just literally just popped it right to them and then you spike it back in your face. Yeah. You're like, wait, what? How did that happen? Like, why, why would I do that? I know. That was so stupid. But it's because they're like, they know that you saw them and they just fully gave up on that call and were completely okay with it. But I, I, yeah, think, I think you put it. I think more right. blockers could like literally squat and not do anything and just like wait for a little drop right. shot over their shoulder. Like, so don't right. even jump. You know who like, does, <laughs> you know, does that? Travis does that. He does it at times where I'm like, he gets I got him on that like, twice that today. So <laughs> he oh, loves doing oh. it too. Yeah, he's gotten so much better at blocking the cut, like delay and blocking the cut. He used to just yeah. try to like stick on you, but now he's spreading himself really wide yeah, and delaying a lot. a lot. So he's like taking that high cross ball way more efficiently. And we practiced against him today. Yeah. So they did it literally oh, nice. for the whole two sets. And I was just like, I know you guys are working on something, but I got the same solution. <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. And then sometimes where I'm like, I feel like uh, you're doing it too much. Because if in a game and I see that, or if you do it too much, I'm going to absolutely blow you up. Yeah. But he's like willing to take that chance. Mm -hmm. And it actually really works and makes me think like, wait, but it, it actually works. Like he's just willing to give up his call because he believes that he already established that he's there. Yeah. And he just fully can give it up and like, step off or like do a full delay or stuff like that because I, I practice he got me like two or three times like that was not a smart pull like, <laughs> you just gave me the whole court and you're standing three feet away if i see that i'm going to destroy you but yeah. but I then you're it. thinking you got no me. way he would do this you know no way he would leave exactly, it that open. exactly and so it's a double reverse exactly <laughs> yeah so i can't i can't blame it and i actually really i'm very hit oriented as a blocker like i don't want you to hit on me but that's a certain timing there's a hit timing for block and there's a shot timing for blocking. Me and Trevor are like opposite, right? Like he's much better shot he's block. He's a great shot blocker. Oh, so annoying that he touches he so much. You're like, exactly. You barely bend your knees. Yeah. You don't get low and you're still yeah. touching my high lines. It's yeah. Like <laughs> his read on the game, his brain to his hands is amazing. Other than that, he looks like an old man. But like, <laughs> yeah, he sees it so well. The but that, that's another efficient. timing thing that people can think of right yeah if, if someone's shooting on you all day well you got to think like am i jumping for a block this whole time mm. maybe i start jumping or sorry what did i just say am i jumping for a shot this whole time or am i jumping for a hit because if they're yeah. shooting and i'm jumping for hits that means i'm up a little earlier so it's just a timing thing where you can be like okay i'm going to be on a shot timing mm. right now until they start hitting again make yeah. them make the change is Rather there a them cue that you wait for? Do you like make sure that you're on the ground until hand contact? Or because I remember like looking at pictures of Jake right before that meeting when I had with Rich yeah. and being like, I'm hitting the ball and Jake still hasn't left the ground. 
And I was like, what, yeah. was he being lazy? Was he just hanging out? And Rich was like, he, he took me through the film session. He's like, no, this is what we do. <laughs> right. Yep. Jake was amazing at it. He had all the tricks. There's not a, for me, I'm very instinctual. So there's not mm. like, I tell myself, because it's different with guys that have a 40 inch vert versus a 15 inch vert, you know? Yeah. If you're trying to time it off their jump. But I think if you're thinking shot, you're just going to leave later. And I think you have to push the boundary of that. Because you might feel way too late, but then you get the block, you're like, oh, that was right. So you have to like push the boundary a little bit and be willing to be late. And what you find is that you see a lot more when you're late too. Yeah. Rather than like up early and you're just like, well, now I'm floating. Like I can't do anything. All I can do is reach around. Yeah. But sometimes if you're late, you're like, oh, I'm still on the ground. So I can kind of like jump that way or jump that way or maybe not jump. You know where you do that like half jump and you're still on the ground and you drop and you come and grab it? Oh, that's great. It's just because you wait. It's not like because you were trying to do that. You just instinctually like, oh, I'm still on the ground. I don't have to fully jump. And you make the play. But that's because you were willing to like push that boundary a little bit. Yeah. I like USA, Alzina and Dodd. They had us do Highline Pepper a lot back in like the uh, elite development thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it was just a drill where all you had to do, it's a rotating drill. Both sides are hitting high lines. You know, defenders go and dig it. Then they return a high line. That defender right. goes and dig it. But... We all had to stop if anybody got touched on the block. And so people were learning how to just reach as high as they could because there was, it didn't matter if they got a kill, like all you had to do is touch the high line. And so I think that drill alone teaches people like, this is how you can try to stop a high line instead of pressing and then reaching. I don't think that's always the answer to the high line. I think it's just doing that high basketball jump and swatting as high as you can without a penetration. Yeah, exactly. So like if you jumped on the hit and then you saw them, so you're already penetrating and then you saw them shooting, yeah, you're gonna do that like press to up. Yeah. But if you're willing to just play the shot or just playing the shot, yeah, I think it's gonna be more back, like you said, that kind of basketball swat or whatever you wanna call it. Nice. Yeah. Cool, man. It's fascinating. It is. Yeah, lots of comments here. You can Thanks stick around comment. and answer them, or you can, <laughs> or you can go get your massage. But I know you got yeah. work to do. Yeah, and oh, actually, I, I gotta get down there. But I saw a few of these. I appreciate the congrats from you guys. Yeah, I'm sure we covered a, a decent amount of it. Appreciate you you all the, the congrats. Best, you had the best comment ever during Trevor and Sander skirmish. Is you guys touch each other all the time. <laughs> Someone was been sitting there. courtside. <laughs> like, why are you mad? You guys touch each other all the time. <laughs> I was like, actually, like, Taylor was so pissed. I was like, damn, like, this could turn into a little something. But he actually, I think he kind of got himself out of the zone there. Usually he's great with that stuff. Yeah. But uh, he wasn't his best version uh, after that, which was great for us. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, someone asked, what did we learn about Taylor that got us locked in on him? Honestly, Taylor, I don't think he played his best match. That's kind of what happened. We stayed steady, stayed in, in our game. He got a little stubborn hitting at me, and I knew he would because I lipped him, dug him, hard driven, and I was like, he doesn't like that, and I don't <laughs> think he believes I could do it twice in a row. So I'm sitting right back in the pocket, and then I did it again, and I was like, he doesn't think I can do it three times in a row, and he sat in the pocket, lipped it again. <laughs> yes, he's making me look good. But right. no, it was more... Taylor's usually playing amazing. As you saw, they beat us in Atlanta. So yeah. it wasn't like a, we found a secret about the guy that we can exploit. Like, oh, we got him now. That's always fun. Definitely not the case. So many yeah. people just want to understand the dynamics of the Trevor and Taylor relationship and be like, do they hate each other? How much do they hate each other? Like, it's clear that they're brothers, but like, would would they throw down on court? Have they thrown down at home? <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun imagining um, brothers versus brothers. You know? Yeah, I grew up with them. So they definitely fought growing up and they played together. They just did not get along at all. You know, Trevor's being the older brother, like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, do things better, kind of older brother. Taylor obviously was like probably the more talented one at the time, plus more talented indoors and all that. So he's just eye rolling his brother, plus wanting to do the party life and all that. Whereas Trevor was like, I can't do the party life. Like, and pull it off like you so like i'm gonna do the serious way and that just clashed and so that's why it was tension there but they live together now and trevor really has adopted like as my brother like i only get one of these or they have another brother but you know Great. two brothers and um, they're super good at leaving it on the court like pictures after t t taylor's there for the whole celebration and they're really good at leaving it on the court they realize that it's entertaining like speak your mind go at each other on the court 
and be a man enough to leave it there. Yeah. They're, they're pretty good at it now. Nice. Yeah. Cool. That's all good. Dude, try. Thank okay. you so much for your time. Appreciate it. We'll see you on the sand, man. Good luck in Chicago. Yeah. I'll be sure. over in Aspen do the mother load. Oh, I've heard good things. I want to play that one day. It's been on my bucket list for a long time. And unfortunately, I have my first opportunity to play it. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Right on. Thanks for you know, the show and all the stuff you're doing for the sport, bro. Cool interview, guys. Really happy to have Try on. We sort of came into beach full time around the same level. And obviously, he has performed at a crazy world class level. He's gone through adversity. He is crazy focused and addicted to fundamentals, to strategy. And it shows in his game. When you dedicate yourself hardcore to doing all the right things, it's really nice to see. And as you can tell, cool guy. So that was an awesome interview. And I got a lot, got a lot of those tips. You know, the things that you see that you need to be aware of, different hand placements for blocking, coming forward on defense, right? Instead of getting in there and kind of on your heels when somebody has to hit hard, having that forward movement on defense. I like that. It's something I've been working on in my game, but instead of drawing a boundary, I think I'm going to go with a little bit of tries advice for next little bit and see if I can start way back in the court and slowly make my way up through the point. Really like that. Just before this video, this podcast was filming, I just got off of the group meeting with the players in our complete player program. We are currently working on defense. We're in the third week of defense. And when you're a part of that complete player program, we take you through every one of our courses, passing, setting, arm swing, attacking, blocking and peeling, defense, serving, and of course our 68 max vertical jump program where we really help people get to the next level physically. So if you wanna check out any of that, you can see what it looks like, betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching. We also have a bunch of pages that tell you specifically about each course. But when you join the program as a member, the cool part is that we're working with you twice a week in video meetings. So in this meeting, we had 16 people show up and did live Q&A. And when we do that live Q&A, it's you're asking your specific questions and me and my coaches are answering them. But also during those Q&As, we take you a little bit through the course and what we do a lot of is video analysis because as you heard from some of this interview, it's not always easy to know what you're doing right or what you're doing wrong without a coach or without a third eye. Sometimes you think you're doing it, but then somebody else looks at it and they say, ah, you're way off, right? That's what we do with the, our complete player program members. You film your games, your practices, the drills that we give you from within whatever course we're talking about at that time or whatever offense or defense or blocking. So you film those drills. And then in our group, people take the links from the private Facebook group that they've posted it in. And then we get to go over that, the video analysis. So we take a look at your game, your skills, your technique. Today, specifically, we were going over movement on defense. And there were a few players who were not quite stable before they moved. And there were a few players who really were rising out of their run when they're chasing on defense and they were doing the right footwork. So they thought they were doing it right. But then when we looked at their torso and the height that they ran at, we realized that they were missing a bunch of digs because of it. So we're able to fix that for them and then give them their next set of video homework. And then they can come back and post it again. So our members post their videos in our Facebook group within 24 hours, me and my team of coaches, we all go into that private Facebook group. We comment, we help them based on the videos. And then if they want that little extra push, we have our two video meetings per week that you can really vibe with us, converse with us, dig deeper into those answers and into your game. And today we also talked a lot about how to balance your physical training with your ball training. And we had some really good specific questions from the group. So I'm really thankful for my members and thanks for joining me today. If you guys want to check it out, head over to betterbeach.com forward slash coaching. I would love to work with you for the whole year. And we have a great staff of coaches and we're absolutely thrilled to help you get to the next level of your game. So if you want me and our coaches and Brandon and Chad and Kyle Friend, uh, if you want us all looking at your videos and helping you figure out where you're going wrong or where you could really get some more points, go ahead to betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching and sign up.
and I'll be seeing you live in meetings. Okay. Quick announcement about our camps. Every camp so far is more than halfway sold out. Some of them are sold out. Those are happening. The October camp is sold out. We have two in November and one in December and January as well. Those are going to sell out pretty quick. Once people start realizing that there's only a few spots left, those are going to get sold out, especially the December 26th and January 1st camp. So we'd love to see you in Florida, hang out with you for seven days of training tournaments, some beach volleyball parties, but lots and lots of hanging out with pros, getting coached and training and tournaments. Those are happening in Florida. And we're also looking for some new places to set up and get a nice beach hotel where we can run those camps. So I would love to see you at a camp. If you can't make it for a full week and you want to bring us to your hometown to run a clinic for either a group of like 12, 15, 20 friends or your juniors club, your facility, get in touch. Head on over to betterbeach.com forward slash clinics. We just need 12 people committed for one full day. That's three, two and a half hour sessions and it's 250 a person and that's it. As soon as you can commit to that, then we will fly at least one of us out there to run a clinic for you, your coaches, your players, or your playing group. And we'd love to hang out with you for a couple of days there as well. If you ever have any questions or you need something, shoot me an Instagram at Mark Burrick. You can shoot our company an Instagram message, Better at Beach Volleyball on Instagram, or feel free to email support at Better at Beach. And we can tell you more about our programs. We can tell you more about how to set up a clinic, what our camps are like. Any of that, I'm more than happy to help you. We've got a great, great staff set up, and I'm so excited for this year. And I just wanted to say, finally, thank you guys so much for this season. It hasn't been over yet. It has not been a great competitive season for me or for Brandon, but what has made it special has been showing up to all the events and you guys coming out saying hi, saying thank you, saying I love your videos. It's so cool to be able to go to the volleyball events and feel like we've done something for the game and that people are appreciating all of the hard work. <laughs> it's been a lot and it's really cool to be, I don't know, in your living rooms, in your cars uh, and become a part of your game. I don't take it lightly. We don't take it lightly. And I'm so appreciative of you and everybody reaching out, saying hi, saying thank you. So from the bottom of my heart, really appreciate you guys being here and listening and giving your attention to us. And we hope every day that we earn it. So that's all I have. Reach out. Until next time, see you on the sand.